Hey folks, it's Dr. Gersmar from Aspire Natural Health bringing you a couple of new interesting studies. So I had accumulated two studies I was going to share with you guys today, then a third one rolled onto my plate, I was excited to add it, then a fourth one and I had to cut myself off there, so today we're going to do four studies. A fifth one rolled in and I said no, that was just too much. So one of my favorite subjects, the microbiome, is back front and center for me today. I've got some interesting uh, results and papers that I wanted to share with you guys, which again just emphasize how much we are a community and not just an individual, right? How very much our bacteria affect us. So pretty much every system that we've looked at so far uh, is affected by the microbiome, especially the gut microbiome. But as we branch out and we learn more, we're going to find there's a skin microbiome. I'm not covering it today, but they actually found that there was a microbiome in semen as well. There's a vaginal microbiome. So pretty much just about everywhere we're finding that there is bacteria that live with us in community that can either help us or hurt us. So the first one's interesting. Uh, the first study, now again, most of these are done in mice, so our, our furry little mice companions. We can't always connect them together, but uh, or rather what happens in mice to what happens in humans. Uh, but in this case, we share a lot in common, so it's likely uh, there's a lot there. Um, so this one had a big name uh, that I'll rattle off for you, and you can uh, go ahead and take a look at it right here if you want. Inflammasome signaling affects anxiety and depressive-like behavior and the gut microbiome composition. So the inflammasome is a big fancy word that says the whole environment, the whole inflammatory environment, the signaling from the inflammatory uh, um, genetics, right, affects anxiety and depressive-like behavior and the gut microbiome. So what they found basically was that inflammation was a key player in anxiety and depression and that it affected the gut microbiome, but also that the gut microbiome affected anxiety or depression. So in this case, they found that giving antibiotics to mice uh, significantly reduced their anxiety, depression, inflammation. So let me rephrase that. Giving antibiotics to mice significantly reduced their inflammation, which seems to have significantly reduced their anxiety and depression. Now the other cool piece that came out of the study was they found that chronic stress altered the microbiome all by itself. So listen, we talk about things like how diet affects the microbiome, we talk about how antibiotics deeply affect the microbiome, but this study shows us that you could be eating really well, avoiding antibiotics, you know, taking probiotics, doing the good stuff that is important to maintain a healthy microbiome. And simply by being heavily chronically stressed, you could be hurting your microbiome. Now, I hope you don't take that to stress you out even more, but it just goes to say when we talk about the fundamentals, what you eat, how much exercise you're getting, uh, sleep, and stress management, that sleep and that stress management, those are the two that are often ignored by health conscious people, right? Most people focus in on needing to eat well, needing to get some exercise, but a lot of us like to skimp on the sleep and the stress management and this study shows us, look, that stress can alter the microbiome, which can then can alter inflammation, which can then alter anxiety and depression. So this gives us two new avenues that we have for people who are suffering from anxiety and depression. So we have other studies that show us that curcumin, the, the extract of turmeric, can be just as effective as the SSRI antidepressants in treating major depression right? Because major depression has been linked very strongly with brain inflammation. So we know that in many instances, curcumin could be uh, just as effective as SSRIs. And look, curcumin has basically zero negative side effects, right? The only side effect that we can't let me say that we do see, when I say commonly see, I mean, if someone's going to have a side effect, the one that we see, and I will also say that we very rarely see it, is intestinal upset, so some diarrhea, right, typically. And generally, that's only on people on high doses of curcumin. So it is one of the safest supplements that I'm aware of. Please, as with everything, use common sense. Uh, if you're not under the care of a doctor, we recommend that you do so. But, and I'm not telling you to take curcumin, right, all the cover my butt uh, uh, statements there, but look, if you're suffering from anxiety or de depression, you have no reason to think it's dangerous, it makes sense to at least consider trying curcumin 
because it could have a big role. But this study also says that by changing the gut microbiome, we could have a significant impact on our anxiety and stress, right? In this case, antibiotics were used. We know we have a lot of other choices. We'll save that for another day. So antibiotics can, in the right circumstances, reduce anxiety and depression. Now on the flip side, a second study that we're looking at showed that feeding mice a cocktail of antibiotics led to cognitive impairment, brain impairment, issues with memory, right? So we talk about brain fog, a pretty common symptom in people we see. And there can be a lot of reasons, right? Low thyroid function, uh, other dysbiosis or, or microbial imbalances are pretty common causes of brain fog. But here, again, and this ties into the dysbiosis piece, they found that, that hitting mice with a hard cocktail of antibiotics led to cognitive impairment. And they checked to say, was it the antibiotics themselves that were causing this cognitive impairment? And the answer was no. It was changes in the gut microbiome that then led to, through the connection from the gut to the brain, that led, then led to cognitive impairment. So here we can compare and contrast. One study says that antibiotics can be helpful for treating anxiety and depression. The very next study, this is why I picked these two out, said that antibiotics can cause brain dysfunction. So on the one hand, it can improve brain function, or on the other hand, it can cause brain dysfunction, right? And this is a big, this is going to be a big piece of what are those antibiotics affecting? What does the gut brain look like? How are these pieces all playing together? So antibiotics, powerful therapy. If they're used effectively, they can help brain issues. If they're used inappropriately, they can cause brain issues. So again, the gut microbiome connection. Now for the third study that I wanted to bring in, it was a link with migraine and irritable bowel syndrome. Specifically, they found that over 50% of people with migraines had irritable bowel syndrome. And in their words, uh, that IBS is characterized by dysfunctions in the processing of information of the central nervous system. IBS patients have increased HPA axis uh, uh, have an increased HPA axis. And if you remember from a previous study, we found that not having the right bacteria in that early infancy caused a sensitization or an increase in the HPA axis stress response. So is it possible that that early infancy, not having the right bacteria, could sensitize the HPA axis, which could then go on to later cause issues with migraines and irritable bowel syndrome. Certainly possible. What the study authors here don't say, and what, you know, what this leads me to believe is, if someone has migraines and they don't have classic signs of IBS, right, that would be abdominal pain and changes in bowel symptoms, could they have IBS you know, dysfunctions, things like SIBO or small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and could treating that improve the migraines? I don't know enough, I haven't experimented enough yet with patients to know, but rather than just rely on migraine medications, it's certainly another avenue to explore. So if you have migraines and or IBS, something to check out. Now the fourth and last study that we're gonna talk about today is the effect of giving probiotics to C-section infants. So this one, in contrast to the first two, which were mice, the third one was hum studying humans with IBS and migraines. The fourth one is also on humans, and this is on babies, okay? So they have four groups here. They have, two of them are infants born by C-section, and two of them are infants born vaginally. Of each group, the C-section born infants, one was fed regular formula, the other was fed probiotic enhanced formula. For the vaginally born kids, same thing, one group was fed regular formula, the other group was fed probiotic enhanced formula. And what happened? So we have, if you don't know, babies, all of us, babies get their initial hit of their microbiome from the mother's vaginal flora. So having good, normal, healthy gut flora, which leads to good, normal, healthy vaginal flora is critical for pregnant women because they're 
going to pass that microbiome on to start their baby's microbiome. So <clears throat> babies, and <laughs> the way the system is designed, right, or evolved, uh, is that babies get their first hit of probiotics being born vaginally. When they're born by C-section, they don't get that same exposure. They get exposed to a very different set of skin bacteria, which starts their gut off, in, frankly, in the wrong direction. Okay, And in the last post, the other post I talked about, where I spoke about the early life uh, wrong bacteria leading to HPA overactivation, we talked about using a vaginal swab. That is, if a baby has to be born via C-section, taking a cotton ball or a bit of gauze or something else, having the mother insert it vaginally and then swabbing the baby, right? Trying to get some of that bacteria into the baby's mouth, nose, ears, on their face, all around to get things started. Well, in this study, they didn't do that. But what they did do is they took the two groups. So again, vaginally born with formula and cesarean born with formula, then vaginally born with probiotic enhanced formula and C-section born with enhanced formula. And they checked to see what happened to their microbiome over time. And what they found was that the vaginally born kids, whether they had formula or whether they had probiotic enhanced formula, did not see significant differences, right? So being born with that, so the probiotic supplementation to vaginally born kids receiving formula didn't make huge changes. But what they found is that the C-section born kids with the probiotic enhanced formulas looked basically normal in terms of their gut flora, while the C-section born kids who just got formula without the probiotics looked very different. Bottom line here is, look, if your kid is born C-section, it is important that they get probiotics. And again, I'm a big fan of the vaginal swabbing. I recommend that that be done unless there's some reason that can't happen. But if even if you do that, uh, but especially if you don't, then your babies need to get probiotics, right? The one used in this case was Lactobacillus ruteri. You can go ahead and check it in the study. But it's critically important that these kids get probiotics. We need their bacteria to start off and function effectively. If you are a healthy mom and your kid is born vaginally, it is less important, though I'm still a fan of giving probiotics, okay? And the obvious question that comes up, would it have been better to breastfeed these kids? And the answer is, absolutely would have been better to breastfeed those ki these kids. And if you did, you may not need the probiotics. We didn't study that. I would still give them anyways. But especially, look, if you're a mom, a dad, grandparents, or have friends and you cannot be that person talking to people, please try your best. If someone is formula feeding, they need to be giving probiotics. Okay, so four interesting studies today. One that showed that our, all about our microbiome, our gut-brain connection. The first two showed that messing with the microbiome can either improve brain function or mess up brain function. The third showed that migraines and irritable bowel syndrome are linked together, right? So again, more gut-brain connection. And the last showed that we can undo a lot of the damage that happens by babies being delivered C-section by simply giving them a probiotic supplement. So there's no excuse for all the docs out there, all the hospitals out there, not to be making sure that probiotics are given to every kid with, who's been delivered via C-section. All right? So the gut is important, right? We need to take care of our microbiome. Antibiotics can cause a lot of damage, but they can also do a lot of good when used strategically, the right time, the right place, all right? If you have migraines, get checked for irritable bowel syndrome and the underlying causes, things like SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because it may really be playing a role in what's going on for you. And once again, babies need to be given probiotics, especially if they're born via C-section, all right? That's it for today's vlog. As always, you can find us at www.aspirenaturalhealth.com or facebook.com slash aspirenaturalhealth. We focus on people with autoimmune disease, 
gut dysfunctions, and other hard to treat cases. We don't give up on patients and we're constantly learning to try and do better. All right? Please feel welcome to contact us. Until next time, take care guys.